workshop was about scaling uh, workers. So it was from the previous. Good afternoon, everyone. So, as I said, this talk will be on scaling effectively with WordPress, uh, particularly in terms of going down the application development uh, route with WordPress and how, from a development process, you scale your WordPress site so it can, so it can grow more naturally and um, with less room for errors and problems. So, there are a lot of misconceptions about WordPress. Um, I'm sure we've all heard these. Uh, WordPress, it's insecure. Only f it's only for blogs and news websites. It's not for real developers. And WordPress sites look too similar. That's one I hear a lot less these days, but it's still out there in the world. There's one big one, um, which we've all heard, and which I hear very often. And in some cases, for some WordPress sites, I believe there is a Big, um, there is some truth to this. It's that it does not scale. Now, I think all the statements I mentioned can be true, in particular with certain projects. Um, and under certain conditions, particularly scaling can be, uh, a very, uh, the problem of scaling can be seen as very accurate. So when I say scaling, what does that mean in a, from a development? point of view. So uh, there are different views on what scaling might be in terms of building software. Um, in my view, websites are just another form of software. That's the way I approach it. So when we're talking about scaling in terms of development, what do we mean? Firstly, I'll go for what we don't mean. It doesn't mean just making something much bigger or making it uh, much, a much larger code base or larger piece of software. Um, uh, also, you know, related, it doesn't mean just adding to something that's already there. Um, does not mean adding more complexity. Um, in fact, I would argue that the reverse is what you should go for. It's not removing old code, although that can be a part of it, but generally if it's legacy code that's actually doing something, then I would argue keep it in there. Uh, not adding more workload or dependencies to any system. So, in the context of a WordPress site, we could argue that's adding plugins or, um, you know, adding to the theme that you've built. Um, I would say scaling is about making something be able to grow organically. Um, by this, I mean with minimal interference or minimal being able to develop it well initially so that there's less need for developer resource later on down the line so that you can easily um, add to it and if there are de is developer resource needed it would you can add some functionality without rewriting everything else um, related to that uh, make something able to be added to without breaking anything else um, this is where things like good development patterns are very good to have and good code structure and um, using object oriented PHP helps with this uh, but there are a lot of other things that go into that and following preset patterns for design implementation. So, particularly in terms of the code that you're writing, if you follow some set patterns for implementation and adding to that beforehand, uh, particularly with, if within your team you're all following similar coding standards and similar guidelines, it means that it's much easier to add to it later on. Uh, allow for progressive improvements. So, this is why I meant you will you allow for any new code to be added progressively. So particularly if you're building something in an agile way where you release the site in you know, a minimum workable version and then add to it later on. If you've scaled it effectively, it should allow for this much more efficiently. It allows for increased workload on the system with minimal impact. So this is not only a server issue, but in terms of uh, if we take WordPress, for example, if you can add extra code to the site without it breaking anything, or if you can add particular plugins that you have built, which are similar to maybe other custom ones that you have built, then, or maybe using some of their same classes, that can actually help. So, this would be my definition uh, for what scaling is in terms of software development and web development and so on. <coughs> 
Um, so you build the system in a way that's so minimal that uh, you build the system in such a way so that minimal effort is required to add to its size or workload, and in doing so causes minimal impact. So why, would a, why may WordPress sites typically have scaling problems? Uh, the big one that I found in many cases, uh, over-reliance on third-party plugins. So the problem there is that a lot of these plugins may use different coding standards. Uh, they may use outdated PHP in some cases, whereas some may be using more modern PHP, or you know, there may be uh, conflicts in their functionality. Um, I've seen this across certain sites where many different caching plugins are added, which... Yeah, it sounds, uh, to, to uninformed users, it may sound like a good idea, but then a lot of that functionality can be conflicting with each other, which can cause memory problems and so on. Um, potentially just uh, badly written code that we see in some places. So maybe um, it's uh, using JavaScript that's not following standards very well, or uh, even using PHP that technically works but could be improved. Uh, the WordPress site itself may not have been updated, uh, the plugins may not be updated, so again it may be using older code and particularly if the server version of PHP or whatever software is running may have been updated but the code base itself hasn't been for that, that can cause some problems. Um, replicates functionality that can easily be achieved without plugins. Um, I've seen this. Uh, I'm not against using plugins, but I tend to take an approach of being very minimal with them. I tend to argue that if um, you add a plugin, uh, or if a member of my team always adds a plugin, uh, I kind of want to see a good reason why and what to get to be gained from that. So I like to keep it minimal, uh, but I can't really give an idea of what how many that should be. That would depend on the site. So if you're replicating functionality that you could easily achieve without plugins or with a very small custom built plugin, then that obviously can cause problems, particularly if that's done in a lot of cases. Uh, poor project management and version control mechanisms. So, this is not necessarily down to exactly the code, but more from a development team culture standpoint, it can cause some problems for the code base itself. Um, I've, I've seen some of these before, you know, changes being made on the fly, particularly on production where things are made, where we I know I've probably made this excuse before that it's a, oh, it's a very small change, but they add up to many little changes which maybe aren't being tracked well or not being put through version control or through proper testing mechanisms, and then it snowballs into quite a big problem eventually. Um, and no formal software development methodology. Now, I'm not arguing that every team should go Agile or Kanban or Scrum to the letter, but it's good to at least... Um, Look at the way these uh, methodologies do things and actually see if you can adapt it to your team in some way. So yeah, if you choose to go with Agile or Scrum or Kanban or many of the others, that's kind of a way to approach it, but I would argue to actually adapt that to your team. Uh, scope creep occurring, we've all seen this when, uh, particularly when building uh, third-party websites, uh, the scope can change a lot, which does happen, but there should be things in place early on, which means that scope creep can be uh, redirected either into something that's a second version of the project or that's uh, maybe a smaller component that you can add to it later on and not forcing it into a project at launch, for example. And I have seen this, not, not often, but probably more than I'd like to admit where I've gone to projects and there's not been an adequate stage in all development sets up where um, it may be that there is a staging in development setup, but again, though, there's always a disconnect between that environment and a production environment, or there's not proper use of those version in systems. So obviously that can cause problems in terms of code being pushed adequately and in terms of the, the code just being kept in good health, so checking it adequately before you actually put it into production. Uh, not keeping themes, cores, and plugins updated. So this is mentioned, and it's it's pretty simple. I'm sure we, I'm sure many of us do realise this. You know, it's, by not keeping those things updated, there's a lot of security vulnerabilities that can be in that code, um, and the code can be in an outdated standard, uh, or it, and it increases potential for conflicts. Uh, if you 
uh, for example, if a plugin actually is using object oriented PHP, it means it's probably calling a class in any particular areas. Whereas if it's using quite outdated mechanisms, there may be functions in there that are actually interfering with others, there might be similar names and so on. Um, if they're the same, actually no, if they're the same, it would often cause a complete error, but in terms of the functionality itself, that's something that could cause conflicts or memory leaks. Um, server or hosting resources that can't keep up with demand. So in this case, uh, yeah, it's not directly down to development, it's more of a DevOps issue or more of a hosting issue, but um, if, you, if there's a lack of control over your hosting environment, then that obviously does limit what you can necessarily do with it and limits how you can actually optimize for that. So if you, um, for example, are hosting a site on shared hosting, um, that's obviously the obvious uh, limitation. So that's why I would always recommend VPS hosting or dedicated server. Uh, they're really not, uh, they are really very affordable now, and there's very good setups for that. Um, I'm not going to mention names, but there's many hosting providers we know who give VPS and uh, dedicated server environments. Uh, and often, even for clients, it can easily be sold to them that it's a pretty cost effective solution when you're looking at more uptime, uh, more control over the server environments, you know, the ability to upscale it more efficiently, and so on. Uh, so, yeah, that's essentially it's default setups being incompatible with project needs can cause this kind of problem. Uh, well, a lack of understanding of WordPress and its structure can cause a lot of these scaling problems. So, if I've seen this in cases where certain themes that I've come across where there's PHP functions being declared within the theme itself and then used when those functions actually exist within core or something very similar does exist within the core WordPress framework. So if, if you get to understand the, um, you know, on the WordPress codex or similar, or the WordPress developer resource, you can see all these built-in functions and what they can be used for. So it's best to use that initially and then just if you need to add more, you declare them in your functions file in the theme and so on. And if, if you also have seen where some things are not following the template structure, so like we have single.php and single dash post type, etc. So it's just the, with WordPress development, the further you go away from the core um, rules or framework in terms of actually developing templates and developing themes, the more room you leave for problems and the more harder it is to actually maintain that, particularly when the um, when you update WordPress, it might cause some problems or so on. Um, and yeah, I'll touch on this as well uh, later on, but with the, if you stretch a WordPress install beyond its capacities without planning for it, then that obviously can cause some issues. So if um, both in terms of the size and scale of the site, but also in terms of you know, if you're going outside of e-commerce and regular e-commerce and blogging, certainly can do that in WordPress and there's many WordPress apps that do that very well but you probably would need a lot of planning to make sure that it's able to scale to that level. Um, outdated techniques and poor code standards. So I've touched on this but if you have any kind of outdated codes or using inconsistency of standards across those things or if there's no proper organization in the code base then that can cause some issues and uh, Using object-oriented PHP, it's not a must-do, but I would say it definitely is, you know, you get huge benefits from doing that. Um, not just in terms of site performance, but also in terms of saving time, really, in writing code yourself. So if you declare a class or an object, then you can reuse, you can put all the related functions into that class and just reuse it throughout your application. But simply put, yes. we can go much deeper into that, but there's no... I mean, object-oriented PHP on its own is more than a talk. Um, but what can we do uh, to scale? So there is a few issues, for, particularly for WordPress, that can cause scaling issues. But what can we do to make them scale more effectively? Um, I will say, firstly, reduce reliance on third-party plugins. Uh, I'm not saying to move away from them completely. I mean, some of them are useful, even from a development point of view. But um, just, uh, I would say, reduce reliance on them where possible. 
um, before our installing ask, is this plugin necessary? Um, will it actually save development resource or will it actually maybe cause more problems later on? Will it be something we'll actually need to um, develop something else to counter against? Um, I take this approach to build a custom plugin to store functionality. Um, it, instead of adding to the functions file within your theme, if possible. So uh, it also helps with debugging. If you can add it to a plugin that you've custom built, then if you do redevelop or change the theme, you can simply move that same functionality across. Um, and ensure plugins are deactivated and removed if they're no longer necessary. I've, I know it sounds obvious, but I've seen this in many sites I've come across. So. Uh, the you know a plugin has been left active since launch, and it's not doing anything. I've seen that several times. So yeah, something that's important to keep in mind. Also avoid avoid the frame, the think of thinking of there's a plugin for this or there's a plugin for that. I mean plugins are they're good to use sparingly, but then you know, sometimes it's good to actually write a bit of code because you'd actually save yourself more time in the long run by doing that in many cases. And from my point of view, sometimes it's actually the easier option to develop for the team to develop their own functionality in-house. So. Right. Um, implement proper project management methodologies to the development life cycle. Um, so I think a mistake that I've seen in some development teams is and particularly with developers who are new to WordPress, they come to it with a mentality of WordPress development being easier or being not like building other softwares or other applications. Uh, but it is a framework like all the others, so it should be looked at in a similar way, I, I argue. So you don't have to follow necessarily any of these or any particular methodology, but it's good to at least know what they are about. So it's just methods... Rather than technical knowledge, it's the way you would organize a project in uh, software development. So if it's a Scrum, Agile, or Kanban, um, or Agile and Kanban are actually, or Scrum and Kanban are actually forms of Agile, uh, or if it's a, you know, very rare now, but waterfall, or test room development. So I think it's good to get at least a basic understanding of a lot of these methodologies, and then look at how if you're in a position to do so, you look at how the team is structured and the company culture and so on, and try and um, think what the best way to actually implement some kind of system in your workplaces. So I would not argue to follow everything to the letter without thinking how you would adapt it to your team, because then it's, um, it, it, that's just a recipe for disaster, um, particularly if you're not taking into account the company culture, because and if you do make the changes, I would say make them gradually. Um, for example, I, in my team, I'm trying to introduce Scrum, but we're doing that in a much slower manner because I feel not only with users, but also with development teams, it's difficult to get people to adopt a new standard if you do it right away and force it right away. So it's best to gradually get people used to you know, some of the uh, concepts and introduce some of the ways of working over time. Um, use solid version control systems. So um, Git is the main one. There's also Mercurial. Uh, use multiple branches in your repositories. Uh, you could, that could be as basic as just a development, staging, and production, or master. And yeah, But I have seen in other cases where we create feature branches. So for each new feature that's being built, you'll create a separate branch and then merge it back into development or so on. That's... That's been some way of doing it. So if you have multiple developers working on a project, you can separate your code out more efficiently in that way. Uh, and it sound, it's obvious, but yeah, don't push to production before putting it through the pipeline. Uh, ideally, you would have some kind of extra script that will run from your master branch to production. But um, yeah, that's yeah, it may be that you would have to just do a git pull, depending on the resources. Uh, keep themes, plugins, and core updated. Uh, as mentioned, I won't go too much into this because we've gone through it already. So, uh, conflicts are more likely if your plugin seems and core are updated, and security and performance benefits can be realised if you keep them updated. Uh, I know sometimes some of you are probably thinking, yeah, we've often updated things in WordPress and it breaks stuff. True, that can still happen, which is why you put things on a development server or a staging server first. 
And ensure you run in a server and if you're going to scale your WordPress site and it's going to be a very large site and it's going to have a lot of resources, ensure you're running it on a server or hosting that can handle large applications and requests. So if ensure it's a server that can handle a lot of traffic and not fall down once it hits you know, a thousand users or not uh, make sure that you can actually run uh, many scripts on there at once or can, yeah, as I said, serve many users and so on. Um, VPS hosting or dedicated hosting is ideal for this. Um, and if you're trying to sell this to clients to pay a bit more for hosting, it's, it's pretty easy to, I would argue, it's much easier now to sell it to clients than it was previously, particularly because that kind of hosting is now much more affordable than it used to be. So, yeah, use a VPS dedicated hosting and ideally also pick one that gives you uh, SSH access. So it may not be yourself doing that, maybe a DevOps and so on. But if you have access directly into the server and access to actually be able to change certain configurations, that'll help you to optimize it. So you know, if you have access to the command line, um, then you can install WordPress CLI and it would just allow you to more scalably manage the application. Um, ensure within your team that there's an understanding of WordPress and its use, strengths and limitations in your project team. So um, it's, it's, this is more around, basically around the misconception that it's only for blogs or news sites or basic e-commerce. So, oh, pardon me. So I'd argue that you need to, your team must have some understanding of that if you are going beyond those core um, uses of WordPress, you can, but it may be that you may need to heavily customize your own code or combine it with other frameworks. And this is where we get into like, headless WordPress and so on. Um, I would argue, if possible at all, do not take the plugin heavy approach to this. Uh, you know, we see there are plugins for uh, social media um, additions to WordPress and there are plugins for all kinds of additions, but I would argue not to take that approach and try and maybe combine it with other frameworks if possible. Um, plan ahead and stick to the scope when planning a complex WordPress site. So if you know that it's going to be a very complex site, you can plan ahead. And yes, things do change, but the more you plan ahead and the more you actually stick to a roadmap, the more easy it is to adapt to any roadblocks that might come in the way. Um, and I'm about headless, so you can look at different options for setting up your WordPress site, if, depending on the complexity. So if, if you do go with the regular, coupled traditional approach where the CMS and the front end are directly linked, or do you go with a headless site where WordPress is just the admin interface? Uh, Multi-site, uh, obviously splitting up your WordPress site into multiple sites within the one site, so they can all be administrated separately. Or decoupled, so uh, similar to headless, but it's as well as serving the data to a third party application, you also serve like cache pages and so on. And the last one, we actually use modern, well structured coding standards. So there's, there's only three, I'm gonna read, three things I'm really gonna talk about here, but uh, use MVC or object oriented PHP where possible. Um, uh, object oriented PHP, uh, two major things of this class is, and something called dependency injection, which I can't go deep into the dependence injection because it's very, it's very technical, but it's something that you can use within object oriented PHP that really cleans up the code and makes it much easier to adapt it. Um, another recommendation, you know, adopt a coding standard in your team and stick to it. This isn't, a coding standard will not necessarily improve the code or how it runs, but it means if you have multiple developers working on the project, it will be much easier to maintain it because from a project point of view, oh sorry, from a project management point of view, it means that you know, commenting and so on is much easier. It's much more uniform. Uh, add to document and comment your code, and use SAS to write CSS rules and compile compile that into CSS files. So the last one isn't always necessary, but um, I I would recommend it. So you use SAS to write your CSS rules, and again, it's much more scalable because it's generally much more intuitively arranged rules, and then you compile that into a style CSS file. So it's not essential, but it does help in terms of being able to scale the rules that you're adding to your CSS and actually be able to maintain it well and removes a lot of confusion and complexity that may 
inadvertently arrived from that. So I said I'd mention three areas. Uh, classes, so this is one part of object-oriented PHP. So thinking about your code in terms of objects. Um, in WordPress, you might put this object as users, post pages, comments, etc., and any attributes that are there associated with them. So you combine, the general idea is you combine any functions that interact with an object into a class, and it can save time in coding and can minimize code created, as well as um, making the calls much more efficient when they're done well. So if we, a very basic example. So if you take an object car and you create a class for that, you could create these uh, set color and get color functions for that. So, and then when we're actually calling that, uh, we just create new, two instances of that car class and then run a set color as we've called it here to actually just uh, add, um, to set a color for each object. And then, you know, if this was much more complex, we would have more functions and it could get more complex and more. Um, but this is a very crude basic example just to demonstrate how it works. Uh, dependency injection, so you reuse, the way this works, you reuse the functionality of other classes or objects in a new class to declare and declare functionality that depends on that functionality. So saves time in coding, it's also a great way to cut down unnecessary code or recoding certain functionality. So again, this is a very, very crude example. It goes a lot deeper than this, but this is, if we were to take the car example again, if you, um, imported car as a class into um, so here the class that we're setting is that's using the dependency injection is the driver class at the bottom so I will explain it because I'm sorry I realize it's a bit so so if we set a class driver then we could import functionality from the car class and then use that within the driver class that we created so I suppose another good example, um, if you think of a torch, that's like, think of that as like an object and almost it's like using a dependency injection from batteries or from a switch. So a dependency injection is when you use the functionality of another class or object within the one that you're declaring. So it's not necessary, but you can, it can help to cut down on uh, unnecessary code and rewriting stuff. But that's... That's a totally separate thing, and you could look into it afterwards because it goes quite deep. Um, and lastly, uh, MVC. So this uh, you know, Laravel and Magento and Symfony is built on this, but I've seen a lot of WordPress themes starting to use this concept. So it's where you divide the model, you divide your code into model, view, and controller. So. And yeah, I've seen this in other, you, you see this in other CMS systems like Drupal, Magento, and also in frameworks like Laravel and Symfony. Um, okay. So to, to put it shortly, uh, model, you, it structures the data in a reliable form and prepares it based on a controller's instructions. The view is essentially just your, your templates, so what the user, what is rendered to the user on the front end. And the controller takes user commands and sends them to the model for data updates and sends that to the view. All right. All right, thank you. That's everything. I would not, I, I, I see a lot of benefits of it, and the reason that I would probably not use it, it would depend on if it's maybe overkill for your use. So if you're still running a very basic WordPress site that's pretty light, then it, you may not really see much benefit from it. Uh, but if you are running a WordPress site that's very, that will be very complex, and maybe it's best to serve that in another application framework, then I might go with that approach. Or if uh, you perhaps want to, you know, syndicate your WordPress content elsewhere because I've 
I've seen that in some cases as well where you know, maybe it's uh, the content has been served in multiple places, so then you might keep it just ahead of the CMS. I did, uh, one, uh, just one quick question. Um, if you're serving a, a thousand users, uh, mm. fairly complex application, what kind of server resources would you assign to that? Uh, in, well, in that case, I would go with a you know, dedicated server uh, with high, you know, good memory. Uh, but aside from that, I'll just, it's not really about the server, but I'd argue use something, you know, a service like Cloudflare, for example, to um, funnel certain traffic if it comes through at a high rate. So. Uh, you made no mention of uh, the, the underlying database, MySQL. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's uh, going to be difficult to scale given the architecture of the WordPress database, is it That's, yeah, that, that's true. Um, there it's are... It's not very good architecture. Mm. It's, um, no, I agree, that is, that is a problem. It's on, there are obviously new versions of MySQL, that is MongoDB and ReaDB, but it's, uh, you're right, that is a limitation at the moment. It's something that Core does can't rely on. I mean, you can technically change the date base it's on, but that's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I agree, that is a limitation. I don't know how you'd overcome that side of it. Fast processor. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the problem would be trying to get the IO, get the information in and out of it, so you'd probably better partition off the database and go back to traditional database methods that we've used for years to handle SQL databases or SQL style databases would be a, you know, so you would separate transactions from data for instance, you would concentrate on, you know, those throughputs of stuff coming in and out, you would need to potentially set them up with different, you know, uh, hardware at the back or whatever, you could, there's many ways you could sit there and actually Work your way through it. I don't, you know, the limitations there, they're, they're not quite at the end of the world yet, I don't think, for, for them just now. But you, you know, you just go back to traditional SQL Fund practices. The fundamentals of this uh, uh, WordPress MySQL database, it doesn't lend itself to indexing because if you have the value here, the structure of the tables, that's very difficult to change yeah. at all possible. Aye, so that, 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 and you're right, that's the limitation of the database design mm -hmm. itself. Which is, uh, uh, and that's a, a different way, but you know, the only way you can do it is to look at those hotspots and then try and work your way around there. But if you see, it's not that much application, very complex. Just one more question. No, I was going to say very quickly the other thing you can do is split the database server onto a different server, um, say, yeah. which yeah. is going to complement what you guys are saying and just have it on two separate servers. You can do it with replicas as well. Um, if you're if you're doing it just with the normal uh, class of the history of the world, it's over. Yeah, so you can yeah. cluster your database also. I've seen that in one project we had. What do you see? Do you put the database on a different server? Well, you, you cluster it into different nodes. So um, oh, right. rather than serving it all from the same, you would have a few. This is only really for very big sites. You might cluster it into different servers and they will serve it from different servers. Well, trying to make the queries less? Or? Yeah, so it, it means uh, yeah, it cuts down queries and. Uh, you know, if one, it also acts as like a backup, so in case an SQL server goes down, it means there's still others that can serve that. It helps with the memory and so on. Thank you. Um, yeah, so with like uh, a typical framework for like Firebox or something like that, um, you've got uh, database migrations and things like that mm -hmm. manage the data between um, production and uh, yeah. development mm -hmm. environments. So what would you recommend for some of that with trying to get data between WordPress? Um, honestly, um, honestly, in terms of WordPress, I don't know what I would. I mean, I work with Laravel a lot, so I know it's. Um, I know about like migrations and seed files and so on. But uh, you probably could set something like that up for your WordPress install. But I'm, I, I don't know the quick and easy solution. So, sorry. Well, you see, you put Laravel, Laravel new the project built into the WordPress system. Is that what you do? I, I have I have used I have done that before uh, so used headless WordPress with a Laravel application but um, in terms of because obviously Laravel has the built-in like database migration so you can just create a seed file for your table or you can generate it through the command line 
and you can move that to a new server. WordPress, I, I mean, it could be something I've just missed out on, but I don't know of a solution like that for it. Uh, in theory, you probably could do that with that too, maybe with Composer or someone, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure off the top of my head how that'd be done. Uh, remember, if you have an idea for the lightning talk, you can go and sign up by the registration desk. And uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you.